You enter a tavern. Its walls are thick with mahogany wood. And the air is smoky. There's sausages. The air of sausages in the room. And mead is flowing from the caskets in the corner. In the other corner that I wasn't referring to, you see a mysterious stranger. The mysterious stranger is holding something. It's an electrical engineering textbook. Hmm. What would you like to do? I'm Batman. Emma, can you just play right for once? I never get to play D&D because you always screw around and wear your stupid outfits. I'm Batman. Okay, noble adventurers, let's begin our quest to find the Laplace Transform. Okay, here it is. We got it. We're done. Everyone go home. You are already home. Okay. Um, well then, uh, let's, let's do some stuff with the Laplace Transform. Hooray. Here's our definition. Okay, so... Later on, you, you may take the 301 course, um, and uh, they're going to call it the four-year transform there. What the Laplace transform is, is it's just kind of a dumbed-down version of the four-year transform. And for our purposes, it works just fine. Um, the only real differences, by the way, are going to be how we treat the S here. This actually just turns into you know, the actual complex number and uh, for the Fourier transform. And then the limits of integration are a little bit different for the uh, Fourier transform as well. So anyways, um, that's pretty much it. So we're essentially doing the Fourier transform. Let's define it first, and then we'll talk about where we're coming from and then what it's doing for us. So the Laplace transform is usually written with this fancy, fancy L of whatever you want to put in. Uh, it's a time-based signal, uh, and actually, when you get to the Fourier transform, you can actually use that for space as well, um, but uh, and then you have spatial frequencies as the output, which is pretty crazy, um, but, uh, but this is it here. We just take a fancy L of X, and all this is representing is the integral of X times this function, this Euler function. And recall that this Euler function is just um, sines and cosines when S is complex, right? When we have that I up there, some kind of complex thing creates a, a bunch of waves for us. So effectively, all this is doing is converting us into waveforms, i.e. it's taking us into a frequency type of space, okay? So this guy is complex, and... Therefore, our output, how we usually write the output, because we don't want to walk around with L's everywhere, right? That'd be annoying uh, unless, you know, you're a computer programmer and you like, you know, doing that sort of thing. Um, of just writing the same, you know, uh, syntax over and over and over again, depending on what language you use. Um, but you, uh, we write it as capital X of S, Okay. And the S here is our, our new domain. So old domain is T, right? It's a function of T. And our new domain is S, whatever the heck that means, okay? So time and frequency is actually what it is. And we'll get to that. All right, so where the heck did we come from and how did we get here? Well, just to recap, um, this is basically the capstone of this course this is like the holy grail um the excalibur okay that the lady in the lake put there this is this is our final super weapon that we're going to develop to tackle transform circuit analysis we need this tool in order to be able to defeat the final dragon all right this is like this is this is excalibur yeah i guess the I don't think King Arthur fought a dragon, though. So maybe this is more like Sir George. I, I don't know. Somebody gets a weapon and kills a big bad thing. It's a, it's a trope. All right. 
that's going to be us. We're, we're, we're going to be the heroes. Okay. So anyways, um, let's, let's do a montage here for our training. <laughs> so we don't have to do all this stuff. Uh, so let's break out what E to the minus ST is. So really it's just broken into two parts, a real and an imaginary part, right? S is equal to a sigma plus a j omega, where this is real, this is imaginary. And when we have that up in the uh, exponent of E, we can break this up into uh, two parts that are being multiplied together, a real part and an imaginary part. So that's going to be handy for us in the future for solving problems. Um, but what's really happening here, why we even wanted to do this in the first place, why we took this crazy journey through, you know, this land was to get here. Because now what I can do is I can transform any signal over into this space. I can transform the constituent um, impulse response into what we're going to later refer to as the transfer function. And I'm going to be able to find the output of any signal, which used to be defined as this convolution, right? We did this big convoluted process uh, in order to be able to find the output given any input, right? We had some input. And we, we wanted to gen generalize our input-output relationship. So we had this convolution and everything that we did. And it took us forever for those problems, right? They, they didn't really help us very much. Well, with the Laplace transform, now we can get there. Because we just convert everything over into the um, frequency domain. We do the operation, but the operation in this space becomes something totally different besides the convolution. Actually, it just becomes a simple multiplication. So if we understand what's happening in this space, in the frequency domain, it enables us to take all of our elements from the time domain, look at them in the frequency domain, and go, oh, well, this is much much simpler here, I can put these pieces together, do whatever operation is necessary. In this case, it's multiplication for convolution. And then I just Laplace transform it back. Assuming the Laplace transform is easy enough to work with and go back and forth with, then I should have no trouble. And as a matter of fact, it is actually pretty easy to work with for most of the functions that we're going to be dealing with. And that's why it's so powerful for us. It provides us a new place to go work on something. What can we do with this? So what? Who cares? Right? What's the big deal? We talked about uh, differential equations. You still haven't convinced me, Art, that I can actually solve differential equations any easier than I could before. This is ridiculous. I'm just learning a bunch of garbage and it's getting more complicated by the day. Actually, it's about to get a lot more simple. Here's why. So if I take the Laplace transform of some function, but I'm going to take the derivative of that function first. I'm going to take the derivative of f, and then I'm going to take its Laplace transform. What happens? Well, if I do the work, and I look at this, and I say, well, I'm going to do a u substitution to solve this guy. I let u equal e to the minus st, and dv equal d of, whoops, boop, boop, of that, uh, the derivative of that function with respect to t. Uh, what I end up with down here is... Oh, well, there's that function. I have my u and my v, right, because the, the, the derivative falls off, uh, times this guy. Well, if I evaluate that from 0 to infinity, as we are prone to do for integration by parts, um, then we end up with just minus f of 0. And that's pretty easy to see because um, when we have this go to infinity... For, and this is equal to, oops, let me write it out this way. This is equal to t, by the way. When this is equal to infinity, uh, e to the minus s to the infinity is zero, um, so that doesn't matter. And then it's minus f of t times e to the minus s times zero, which is uh, one. But it, it's also f evaluated at t equals zero, so it's just f of zero uh, with a minus sign in front. So it's pretty easy on that end. 
Um, note here that S has to be friendly to this, okay? And we're going to talk about convergence here in a moment, but um, S has to not uh, do something that makes this not converge, okay? It has to work. Uh, again, we'll get there in a moment. So on the other side here, uh, the next term, we have S times f of t times e to the minus st. Recall that uh, u is equal to this e to the minus st. So when we take its derivative with respect to t, now it's just going to drop that s down. So all we're left with then is just f times e to the minus st. Well, as it turns out, this is actually just our original function uh, and have, excuse me, it's our original function under the Laplace transform. So as a matter of fact, the Laplace transform of the uh, derivative is equal to the Laplace transform of just the function itself times s minus whatever that function was at zero. And that's just going to be some constant, right? Because we're evaluating it at a specific point. So this is actually very powerful. If f of uh, zero is even zero, this is uh, much more simple to see. The derivative, taking the derivative of a function before I take the uh, Laplace transform, just tax an s in front. That's it. Plus some constant. Okay? No surprise there. Uh, you know, kind of a holdover from calculus. We always have that plus some constant, right? All right, so let's extend this a little bit. Let's think about what happens when I take two derivatives. Okay? One derivative was great. I want two derivatives now. So if I take the second derivative of f, I apply that rule, and then I apply that rule again. I can actually just do that, right? Um, and I end up with, because I could uh, define this, by the way, in case you're not following, this is d of dt of d of t, like so, right? So this, this new function, you could call it f prime of t, would be this, and I just apply the same rule twice. So this is a, a whole unit, if you will, for this line of inquiry. Okay, so don't don't overthink it. It's just it's just applying the rule twice. Okay, so now I end up with this. I have s squared when I've taken the second derivative times my Laplace transform, and then I have some constants going on here. Now, if f at 0 was equal to 0 and the derivative of f at 0 was equal to 0, I pretty much just end up with a generalized equation that looks like this. Again, assuming s is nice and plays friendly. Okay, But what would this do for ODEs? Well, it turns all of my ODEs into polynomials, right? Because they just turn them into, with respect to s, some uh, function of s times s to the n. That's it. So ODEs become polynomials. This should not come as a surprise because this is exactly what we did for the characteristic equation. Let's try some other functions that might be of interest to us, okay? Um, let's look at the impulse function. Little Dirac delta t, right? Well, the Laplace transform of uh, delta t is equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of the delta function times that exponential. Well, we know the delta function behaves kind of funky underneath uh, the integral. Um, but we know that it, it's essentially just returning to us what we put in. Um, and it's only doing that at 0 or at the input of t equals 0. So the only place we actually evaluate anything for any of this expression is whenever t is equal to 0. And in fact, that just leaves us with e to the minus s times 0, which is just 1. So our Laplace transform pair then here is the delta function corresponds to 1 in the, uh, in the frequency space. Okay. Well, the, I mean, that kind of makes sense. We knew that the uh, delta function was some kind of, uh, 
identity function or or a special it had special properties right so the fact that it's equal to one here in our transformed uh magic land of frequency should come as no surprise i mean realistically okay so what about um if we transform our step function we liked we like that step function let's see what that's going to look like in our new space so when i do the work here I have the step function times this. Well, really, the step function goes from 0 to 1, right at 0, right? And so it kind of just goes away. <laughs> so we don't have to worry about it. And it's just we're just taking the integral of e to the minus st. And you should know how to do this. Um, you know, do the antiderivative here. It's very simple. And then evaluate it at the appropriate bounds. And so all we end up with then is... Uh, 1 over s. You'll notice that the minus sign here cancels out because uh, this one goes to 0 and this one gives us 1, um, but it's a minus sign, so there you go. Now, we have to be careful here because we're making an assumption about s. We're making the assumption that s behaves nicely and that as long as this guy is finite, so as long as when t goes to infinity, um, this thing converges to 0, effectively, right? We, we were making the assumption that this converges to zero because T is not just a constant, right? It's a variable. It's some variable. So we have to be very careful that, um, you know, we don't let it equal to anything that is not sensible. As a matter of fact, um, if this minus sign wasn't here, right, then we'd have an issue because we generally assume, hey, everything was positive, but if, if S is negative, right, then what happens? Well, if s is negative, then the then the thing up here becomes this is all positive. And so I have an exponentially increasing function. Well, as t goes to infinity for an exponentially increasing function, uh, it does not converge to zero. It actually converges out uh, to the middle of nowhere. Or I'm sorry, to uh, to infinity. So that would be bad. We don't want that. So we set rules. We set what's called a region of convergence. And so e to the minus st is only convergent to zero when the real part of s, which we designate with re of s, is greater than zero. And so we can write uh, comfortably our Laplace transform is equal to this. But the region of convergence, the, the places for which this is true, well, the conditions under which this is true is only when S, the real part of S, is confined to being positive. In case you're still kind of missing out what's going on here with ROC, because this is kind of difficult to grasp at first, ROC, region of convergence. Um, just pop in a number here, okay? So if S is equal to 2, right? e to the minus 2t. Well, yeah, that converges. That goes to 0 as t goes to infinity. If s is equal to minus 2, well, that's e to the minus minus 2, so plus 2 to the t. As t goes to infinity for that, oh, shoot, that's that goes to infinity. That's no good. All right? So that's, that's why we have these regions of convergence. We have to make sure that although s is a variable, that we restrict it to things that make sense. Okay, a couple more examples. And these are actually going to be very important. They're not just examples. They're actually pairs. So we're like uh, basically collecting Pokemon right now, right? So yeah, we want to catch all these different uh, functions, essentially, that, uh, that we're going to use to have shortcuts for developing Laplace transforms. So let's look at another one here. We have uh, another, it's not quite a, quite a Pokemon. I don't know what you'd even name this one. Probably something stupid. They never have good names for any of them. <laughs> but you knew all of them as a kid. I know you get, I know you guys had Pokemon too when you were growing up. I know I did. Um, but they've been, a, they've been around for a long time. I actually got the first generation. Okay, so let's 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 catch another Pokemon. All right, so we're gonna call this the unit ramp 
function, R of T. I really hate this notation, <laughs> this letter for this, by the way. Um, but there we are. That's what we have in the book. So this is actually just T times UT. So what does this look like? Um, well, this is at T equals zero, it's zero. And at T equal one, it's equal to one. And at T equal two, it's equal to, uh, well, two. Um, and so on and so forth. So it actually just goes up like this. It's just a, just a ramp. Ta-da. And before that, it's equal to zero. So notice here that the step function itself went here, right? It just goes up to one on a good day. Come on. There we go. So that was the UT, and then this is TUT. Okay? All right. Shouldn't be too hard to see that. Unless I don't write it right. There we go. Okay, so what happens when I integrate this thing? And by integrate, I mean take the Laplace transform. Well, and for those of you that are really worried um, that I haven't made a Transformers reference yet, uh, don't worry, they're coming. Off we go. Uh, we have this. This is equal to t to the e minus uh, t times e to the minus s t dt, which is equal to minus t over s e to the minus s t zero to infinity minus zero to infinity of minus s e to the minus s d s t dt. Um, just another integration by parts, no big deal. Um, should be able to do this by now. We work through this a little bit more. We end up with uh, zero up here. And we end up with uh, minus one over s squared e to the minus st from zero to infinity. Which, as it turns out, is just equal to one over s squared when we're all said and done. Huh, so that's... Uh, it's kind of interesting. We, for the unit step function, we had one over s, and we just had um, a ramp attached to it. Okay, so then we can write this, then formalize it, codify it, if you will. And our region of convergence here is similar for the same reason, right? We want that e to the minus st to converge, so we need it to uh, go to zero properly. Um, so we need that s to be uh, behave a little bit. So we notice here that this uh, this looks awfully similar to what we got for ut, right? Why is that? What's up with that? Well, actually, as it turns out, um, what happens if we took the derivative of rt? Right? What's the derivative of rt? Well, the derivative of rt is just it's looking up at our chart here, our graph. It's zero all the way through here, right? And then it has a constant slope of 1 after that point. Oh, okay. So if I was to evaluate the derivative of RT, it actually is just equal to UT. But I know that based on my rule that I found before about differentiation, that if I take the Laplace tra transform of the derivative of something that I'm aware of already, then it's just going to be equal to s times the Laplace transform of that thing. So, so let's reassess this real quick. The Laplace transform of the unit step function is equal to the Laplace transform of the derivative of RT, right? Because we just showed that, you know, UT is the equal to the derivative of RT, our, uh, our uh, ramp function. And so we apply the rule that we have from before, and we end up with s times the Laplace transform of rt. And as it turns out, this is equal to s times 1 over s squared, which is just 1 over s, which is what we found exactly for uh, ut here. Okay? So the rules are working. Things are in motion. The gears are turning. All right, let's tackle the Laplace transform of an exponential function. In this case, our basis is just this. We have to tack on this extra ut here because it has to only start at zero. Uh, what this function looks like going into it is just, let me draw the axes first. All right, at time t equals zero, uh, 
before zero, it's zero, and then it's just this exponential decay. And our decay rate is determined by A, right? And it hopefully uh, converges to zero, because if it uh, doesn't, then we're in trouble. And note here that, uh, generally speaking, we assume that A is positive. But that may not be the case, and it may not need to necessarily be the case for some things. So if we do other things to this function, um, we can kind of get a little sneaky and crafty with it. But for all intents and purposes, um, A is going to be greater than zero for us here. Okay, So you want that decay function. You don't want it to exponentially grow. That would be bad. All righty. So let's do the work here. See, these aren't too bad. Like all these uh, Laplace transforms we're doing are actually very, they're all very easy to work with with calculus, right? So not too many issues. We write this out. This is the formal definition, right? And I dropped off the UT because no one cares about it anymore, right? We're taking our integrals with respect to uh, zero to infinity. Now you will need to be careful though. You will need to be careful of this if you do some time shifting before you take your Laplace transform. If you do some time shifting, all my noble, noble time lords, uh, you need to be careful, all right? So be careful if you get, get wibbly wobbly. All right, so what we can do for this one then is combine stuff. And in combining these two things, we almost can think about it as being a kind of substitution. No, no, we're... Go away, Naruto. We're done with you. Get out of here. It is kind of a substitution, though. Naruto's right. Um, we could think about this as being 0 to infinity of e to the minus s prime of t, where s prime is equal to s plus a. And in this case, we know what this is, right? This is the same thing as ut, more or less. We're just shifting it around a little bit, where ut was equal to 1 over s. Well, if this is s prime now, then we just do a simple, I'm going to say it, but you're not coming back out, Naruto, substitution, okay? No, go away. Get, get out of here. Okay, we're, we're just going to plop this in here as... Are we justified in doing this? Well, yeah, actually, but we have to be careful. We have to be careful about those, the, the pesky region of convergence. And that's really important here, more so than anywhere else. Um, because it's not intuitive here, right? Before it's like, well, okay, just, it's gotta be greater than zero. It's gotta be greater than zero. Now for the first time we've encountered something where it's like, uh, it's gotta be greater than something. I don't think that's zero. Let's have a look real quick and see what it actually is. So if I'm looking at evaluating e to the minus s plus a of t, then the real portion of this, right, does it converge as t goes to infinity, then the real portion of s plus a must be greater than zero. So you could also write this as the real part of a or s plus the real part of a, right? Because remember, the real and imaginary parts are always separate from each other. So if S is equal to some A plus B I and A is equal to some, okay, bad names. Uh, this is actually Sigma plus uh, Omega J. And this is some other Sigma plus Omega J, whatever letters you want to use guys. It really doesn't matter. Um, then what I end up with is I'm only dealing with the real parts of it. That's all I care about. Why is that? Well, if we think about it for a moment with, the exponential stuff, it's either decaying or it's growing, right? With the real numbers. But what's happening with the, uh, uh, the, the J part, the imaginary part of an exponent? Well, we already talked about that. It's just oscillating. So it's just going up and down, up and down, up and down. I don't care necessarily that it's doing that um, as long as it's converging in with respect to, you know, the real inputs that I have up there in the exponent. So the big takeaway here is that the real part of this has to meet a certain criteria that allows it to converge from what we know about real numbers. So the only difference here between, in summary, 
between the real and the complex is that the real either does this or it's or it's equal to zero in which case this is just a constant which we also don't want right that's um we can deal with it but it's not what we exactly want um for reasons i'll explain in a second or we end up with this okay or not that or we end up with this <laughs> right so this is growth this is decay and then when we add in imaginary elements, all this is doing is it's just tacking in these oscillators into our decay or our growth. And if I have a constant function, let's say I have neither growth nor decay, this, this, the, the real part is equal to zero, then I just have crazy undamped oscillation. Well, this doesn't converge either nicely, right? So we don't really want that. So what we really want to focus on, or what we really want to happen for this transform, is we want that, that decay. So this criteria must be met. And you could also rewrite this. The book has it as the real part of S is greater than negative real part of A. I find this more intuitive, or this more intuitive, but you can do it this way too. Doesn't matter. So... The way you would write this then is the, the following e to the minus at Laplace transform converts me into this with a region of convergence, meaning this criteria must be met for it to be true of R E S greater than minus real portion of A. Okay, that's it. I know there's a lot of rambling for for the exponentials, but it's really important that you guys understand what these functions are actually doing. Okay, let's do the next one. Uh, the cosine function. I have a cosine function, which is cosine omega naught t. And I'm going to tack on this obligatory uh, step function ut. Okay, so if I write this out, I have this. And this isn't really ideal to work with. It's kind of yuck. So a better way to do this would be to use Euler. So I can rewrite my cosine as follows. It's one half e to the j omega naught t plus e to the minus one, I'm sorry, minus j omega naught t. And of course, the uh, the step function goes along for the right. I'm going to drop it off here because we don't really need it. Um, great. Okay, so now I just have to do the Laplace transform of this thing, don't I? Wrong. I don't actually need to even do that. Um, I already did this one, didn't I? So this is the exponential. This is also the exponential. Here, a is equal to minus j omega naught. Here, a is equal to j omega naught. And then this is just a constant along for the ride. And what I can actually do with the Laplace transform, and you should be able to see this very easily from the definition, is I can take it and distribute it over terms. Why can I do that? Well, by definition, it's just an integral. And we know that the integral um, also can distribute over terms, right? We can break integrals up um, based on their constituent terms. And so what I end up with here is just, and let me make a little bit more space, one half Laplace transform of e to the j omega naught t plus one half, and I'll leave the one half on the outside. plus the plus transform of e to the minus j omega naught t. Again, there's kind of an assumed ut here, so don't forget about that. It's more important as we go along, but not important here. And this is one half, and we just use that old formula we just derived. And we just let a equal to that thing. So this is one over s plus uh, a negative, as a matter of fact negative j omega naught 
plus 1 over s plus j omega naught. Okay, and your the hairs on the back of your neck should be sticking up right now because there's no reason for these two to be separated from each other. Um, and in point of fact, whenever you see complex conjugates just hanging out together, um, you should readily be thinking, hey, this actually looks like they could go together. And the reason is, is that S minus J omega naught times S plus J omega naught is always equal to S plus S squared plus omega naught squared. Why do I know that? Well, I know the difference of squares rule is uh, A squared minus B squared is equal to A plus B times A minus B, right? This you should know. You should have this memorized. If you don't, shame on you. But when I have a complex number in here, this J gets squared, and so it makes it a minus 1. So then uh, for imaginary numbers, I get the plus in the middle here, which is really nice. And the reason it's really nice is because it actually gives me a magnitude, right? I'm actually taking a magnitude. You may recall uh, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Well, when you're taking the magnitude of a vector, right, I have an X component and a Y component. I want to know the total magnitude of the vector. Let's say this is A and this is B. Hey, what do you know? This is actually A squared plus B squared square root. So what I end up here with is um, the square of the magnitude of the vector. So this is going to come into play a lot more later on, but just know that there's some, some uh, gerbils on wheels that you can't see right now working very hard at keeping the math uh, very friendly. So off we go. Uh, we're going to multiply this one top and bottom by S plus J omega naught, S plus J omega naught over S squared plus omega naught squared. And then this guy, we're going to multiply top and bottom by S minus J omega naught. And for reasons we just discussed, the denominator becomes that. So now when I add these together, ah, these two will cancel, and I'm just left with an S on top. So I have one half of S over, I'm sorry, not just S, but 2S, in fact, uh, S squared plus omega naught squared. And then the twos cancel politely, and I end up with S over S squared plus omega naught squared. Wow, what a nice result. That's very pretty. Okay, so region of convergence for this one. Yikes. Um, well, when does it converge? Well, as a matter of fact, um, it's not too complicated. Because what we have is we have our old friend here. And our region of convergence is whenever the real part of A, well, actually our A's, our A's here, we'll do this in big red letters, our A's here are imaginary. So as the, the real part of this is zero. So we're just left with the region of convergence where the real part of S must just be greater than zero. So nothing too bad there. So... It's a little bit nicer there. There you have it. Uh, the cosine uh, taken in its Laplace transform gives us something that looks like this. Now keep in mind that these aren't functions of real numbers, right? This is not a function of S where S is real necessarily. It's a function of S where S is a complex number. And so this whole equation or expression exists in the complex plane. It actually exists with two axes at play, which is kind of a weird thing because before... You know, we said that there's two components to any complex number, and with time, there's not. It's just one component. The sine function is very similar, except we have sine omega naught t is equal to uh, 1 over 2j. And in this case, we actually take um, e to the j omega naught t minus e to the minus j omega naught t, okay? And when we work this out, you can see this sign here is going to cancel out instead of the, et, or bleh, instead of canceling out the j omega naughts, if this is a minus sign here, it's going to actually cancel out the s's and leave us with the j omega naughts. Okay, and so what we end up with then is that uh, sine omega naught t 
by a very similar process, it's almost exactly identical, is equal to, uh, under Laplace transform, omega naught over S squared plus omega naught squared with the same region of convergence. And that's it. So the book actually has a really nice uh, table for this. And it's also in the back of the book too, so you don't have to flip through pages every time. This is in the appendix as well. And this is by no means exhaustive. You should, and I encourage you to, find a more exhaustive list of these. Go catch those Pokemon, okay? And uh, hopefully um, you get a feel for what these things look like because as we move back and forth between these, we generally don't want to have to solve that integral over and over again. And what we're going to do is compile these pieces together to form rules for ourselves that allow us to move between um, the time domain and the frequency domain easily using the Laplace transform. So that'll be uh, more next time. We'll look at how to move back and forth. Actually, what is next time? Next time is more properties. We're going to look at more properties of the Laplace transform. So chapters 19 and 20 are both going to be Laplace transform theory specific. And then when we get to chapter 21, we're going to start talking specifically about um, the dual concepts of impedance and admittance from there. So it's going to get really fun after this. We have some new toys to play with and, and we should all be very excited. I know I am. I'm ready to go. Um, so I'll see you next time.